Well, good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 Tak Yan Lee Lecture hosted by Gordon College's Center for Faith and Inquiry. We're grateful for the, uh, the generosity of Mr. Raymond Lee who has endowed this annual lecture in honor of his late father, uh, Tak Yan Lee. My name is Chad Stutz and I chair the English Languages and Linguistics Department here at Gordon in addition to uh, teaching some courses in the, uh, the Gordon uh, Global Honors Scholars Program. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Barker, who directs the, uh, the Center for Faith and Inquiry, uh, has unfortunately been feeling a bit uh, under the weather for, uh, for the last few days. So um, with a great deal of regret, uh, he felt it uh, wise not to attend today out of an abundance of, of caution. Uh, so he therefore asked me if I'd be willing to uh, step in and introduce this afternoon's uh, speaker, uh, which I gladly agreed to do since it gives me an opportunity to, uh, to sing the praises of uh, another dear colleague of mine, Dr. Elaine Phillips, who will be uh, speaking to us today on the topic of physical theology, margins, and wildness in the book of Job. Uh, for many here, of course, uh, this afternoon, Dr. Phillips really needs no introduction. Uh, she is, and, and I don't use this language lightly, uh, she's something of a legend uh, around Gordon's campus, having served for almost three decades as professor of Old Testament. In 2014, she was appointed Distinguished Professor of Biblical Studies, and she currently holds the title of Harold John Ockengay Professor Emeritus of Biblical and Theological Studies after having retired from Gordon in 2020. Elaine, as many of you know, is an accomplished scholar. In addition to numerous articles and other writings, uh, she's published a book-length commentary on Esther, a devotional entitled With God, Nothing is Impossible, and another book in 2017 entitled An Introduction to Reading Biblical Wisdom Texts, which was uh, written to help college students and other non-specialists uh, better understand and appreciate the scriptures. I think as these uh, different contributions suggest, uh, Elaine has a remarkable talent for articulating uh, complex scholarly ideas in a way that, uh, that even non-scholars can, can understand. Perhaps not surprisingly, therefore, uh, Dr. Phillips is also a beloved teacher and mentor. Uh, during her tenure in the Biblical Studies and Christian Ministries Department at Gordon, she received both the Junior and Senior Distinguished Faculty Awards, uh, she and her husband, Perry, have also led groups of students on numerous trips to Jerusalem University College, uh, where the two of them continue to serve as adjunct faculty members in the three-week summer study program in historical geography. And in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, she and Perry have also uh, graciously agreed uh, in a very last-minute kind of way to, uh, to accompany some of our honor students to, uh, to Greece in just a few weeks. So thank you for that. I know they're very excited, so thank you. Uh, and the two are also serving as special mentors this semester to students in our Frost Fellows Program. Uh, aside from her many accomplishments as both teacher and scholar, uh, maybe the best thing uh, that I can say about Elaine here this afternoon uh, is that she embodies for me, and uh, I think really for so many others within the Gordon community, um, what it means to carry oneself with, uh, with godly wisdom. In fact, Elaine is one of those people who just seems to, uh, to exude this kind of wisdom in, in everything she does. Um, from the moment that I met her almost 11 years ago now, I was struck with her godly character uh, and her kind demeanor. And uh, I quickly discovered that pretty much everybody else around Gordon feels exactly the same way about Elaine. So, uh, so anyway, if you don't know her personally, uh, I think you'll see firsthand in, in just a moment uh, exactly what it is that I'm talking about. So without further ado, uh, please join me in warmly welcoming our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Elaine Phillips. Well, thank you, Chad, very much for such kind words. Um, I hardly know what to say after that, so I'd best get into the lecture, but I have two more thanks already to offer. One is to my dear colleagues and friends in the CFI department who have been so good and trusting to ask me to do this lecture. Is there an echo going on here? Yes. How are we doing up there? Is that helping a little bit? I'll let you guys take care of it. That's fine. Uh, and then I also uh, want to give a thanks to Raymond Lee, who has uh, sponsored this lectureship in honor of his late father. 
Uh, Ray Lee was one of the first people who so kindly interviewed me some 28 years ago before I started teaching, as I was a candidate to come and teach at Gordon College, if you can imagine that. So this goes back kind of a full circle and a nice long ways to come back. Uh, thank you all for coming, too. I should say that as well. So without any further ado, um, we need really to make sure we're all on the same page. Our first task is to get on the same page with regard to this expression, physical theology, because you may not necessarily understand exactly what that means. And there may be a temptation to uh, confuse it or interface it with something called natural theology, which I'm going to take a moment to define and then dismiss. All right, not dismiss as a, an important thing, but dismiss for our purposes here. Uh, the traditional understanding of natural theology, and this is actually kind of a, a going back to the 18th and 19th centuries and the cultural milieu then, but at any rate, the idea was that knowledge of God can be derived from study of natural phenomena, and then this last line is the giveaway, entirely independent of special revelation. Now, we have a tempered version of that now, a more chastened view of natural theology, and I'll just read this for you, you can read as well as I can, seeks to relate the sciences, history, ethics, and the arts, that's rather big, aren't you glad we're not doing that today, uh, as we envision a place of humanity in our universe. This gives at least a place for faith as being a seat at the table. But having said all that, that's not what we're talking about today. All right, so we're moving on to physical theology. I have my dear friend and colleague, John Monson, uh, to thank. He teaches at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I've known him for a long time, and he's the one who I think coined this term, even though it's something that's been studied and done for a long time. It runs like this. Because God has revealed himself and by the way, you know this from your theology classes. In space, time, and culture, scripture is brimming with named places. Descript descriptions, of, by the way, some of those named places are hard to pronounce, right? We know that. Descriptions of topography and land resources and the effects of natural phenomena on the communities who were living in these contexts and often living, as I note for you, in a subsistence mode. That's the beginning. Let's go on. Therefore, the original contexts of scripture, in other words, lands, plural, cultures and languages are essential to understand the message of the Bible and its contemporary relevance. So don't think for a moment that what we're doing today has no contemporary relevance. I may have to go really fast, but at least we'll make some connections, I hope. The land was God's testing ground of faith. Uh, Jim Monson, you can see that fine print, is the father of John Monson. They lived in Israel for most of their lives, actually, and knew Israel and the context so very well. And I am honored to say that Jim Monson was one of our teachers when we were there. Um, learned so very much from him. But he called this land the testing ground of faith, which does bring geography right into mixture with our faith and theology. Carrying on, our fine print also says Paul Wright. He, too, was a student of Jim Monson. And as he has been shepherding Jerusalem University College for the last 20 years, he would say, he was wont to say, the lessons of scripture are written in the land. Woe betide us if we are not familiar with the land. Now, most of the time we spent on the western side of the Jordan River, and I'm going to say more about that in a moment. Job's story will unfold in even more marginal areas. That's where our title has margins in it. One more lens that I want to introduce you to. There is a very good Old Testament scholar whose name is Mark Boda, who uses these three in continuum. Geoecological, and the, for those of you who are studying ecology, you know what that's all about. Geopolitical and geocosmic. Isn't that a fun continuum there, right? He sees this as a continuum for the study of geography. So here is just a nutshell of how we're going to try and put some stuff together in the next 45 minutes or so. First of all, our ecological contexts, the things that have to do, everything with the land, stuff I mentioned a moment ago, and the land's productivity, or lack thereof. All these things are foundations in our social and political spheres because we address issues of ownership, wealth, status, power, control, conflict, and conquest, and those are all in the Bible, aren't they? 
right, in one form or another, sometimes positive, sometimes not so positive. So those are going to be extremely important. But if it ended there, it wouldn't be nearly as, uh, have nearly as much implications because the characteristics of the land, which we are going to talk about in the next 45 minutes, are also intertwined with ethical obligations. For those of you who have taken Old Testament and you've studied the Torah, you know this. It's all embedded right in there. But also, these characteristics of the land point to profound theological truths. I'm going to give you one example as we start, and then you're going to see some unfolding as we move along through the rest of our time together. Here's our introductory example, water. Now, I know, because it's been raining a lot here, that water doesn't necessarily make quite so much difference to us. But it certainly did in those contexts. It's essential for life. We all know that, although we don't experience the, the, the pressures of that quite so much. It's the backbone for agricultural productivity and community well-being. And I want to just show you a picture which will help us see that a little bit. This photograph was taken from the Nile River. It's 1992. And if you look at it, I just want you to notice a couple of things. We could probably unpack it a little bit more. But next to the Nile River, it's all marvelously green, isn't it? Because the floodplain is dealt very well, a nice, a nice deck of cards, if you will, by the Nile flowing through, flooding, and then all the produce can grow. However, look at the backdrop. It's dry as a bone. Let's look at another perspective at that in just a moment. By the way, I should have added this too, even though this has nothing to do with this picture. We're going to return to some of these things a little bit later on. Uh, water is not just water. It shows up, as I note for you, as hail, snow, rain, thunder, lightning. Those two are going to have some very profound theological messages. I'm coming back to these passages that are here a little bit later on. Well. I'm going to give you another angle on this water thing. And if we had time, we could do this a little more slowly. Some of you have seen this picture. Hannah has seen this picture. Uh, some of you have seen this picture in class already. But I want you to take a moment, based on what we just pointed out about the Nile River Valley, to see if you can find evidence of water in this photo. Anybody see what they think might be evidence of water there? Yes. Well, the clouds are there, true, but I'm, see, forgive me, I should have been a little more specific. I'm talking about on that dry ground. Look at the arrow. Do you see that little ribbon of green there? That tells us that water has been going through that area, okay? Has been at some point. Now, try to find evidence of human presence in this. I know, we can't take time for you to just sort through every inch of it. But there it is. That's me. But I'm transient. I was a visitor. I didn't live there. Hard to live there. But it also gives you a sense of how vast this is. This is the vast wilderness of Zin. And that name ought to ring a bell for us in terms of the book of Numbers and the wanderings of the Israelites in that context. So we get a sense, even from these initial photographs and reflections, that physical theology might have something to uh, help us with as we make our way through the scriptures, if nothing else. Now, journey to Transjordan. We went for the first time to Transjordan in 1976, and you're thinking that's the Dark Ages, and it really was, but it was also a time when it was very different in Transjordan from where most of the Middle East is now. It was wild, and it was on the margins, and I could spend probably a whole hour talking about that, and I won't. But here's our journey to Transjordan, and we're going to look particularly at southern Transjordan. A wadi, by the way, is a word that's going to be important for us because it means a dry riverbed, right? It means it's an Arabic word. It means a dry riverbed. And throughout some of our talk, we're going to use the term wadi, and that right away clues you into the fact that this is a marginal area. This is Wadi Rum in southern Transjordan. It is beautiful, and it is dangerous because it is dry and barren. You can see some wild animals roaming on that picture on the left-hand side. OK, that's sort of a overarching physical theology type introduction. And now you're asking, why are you doing Job? I mean, generally speaking, if you think of the book of Job, you think of theology, 
and we're wrestling through all the issues that come up with regard to the book of Job. Or maybe if you're a literary person, you're thinking of all the literary issues that are part of the study of Job, because those are important as well. But we are going to look at him in his context, that physical theology context, because there are some fascinating things that show up in this book with regard to the basic way of life of people who lived a semi-nomadic existence, by and large, in the desert. So flocks and herds, property. I've got boundaries and quotation marks. They were very flexible. Flora, fauna, communal settlements, and communal settlements often under threat because there would be raiders coming in from the desert, if nothing else. These things are all embedded in the text. Now, I'm just giving you a lovely Marc Chagall picture of Job. This uh, painting, by the way, is called Job in Despair. And we know that sense in terms of reading Job. Well, for those of you who have had wisdom literature, this is a review. But I want us, since I'm going to be referring to various aspects of the book, I want at least to give an outline of this book. And this will remind some of you of where uh, some things are and who's involved in this book. Uh, shape of the book in general. Well, it has a narrative introduction. There's two chapters of narrative. But even for our purposes, we're going to mine those two chapters for something else, aren't we? Because as we look at the locations of the story, we're going to find out they're in the margins. This is a narrative that takes place in marginal areas. We'll look at some of those. Also embedded in those first two chapters are some rather interesting challenges between the Lord God and the accuser or the adversary. And those certainly take place in marginal areas, beyond the margins. In chapter three, Job gives an initial outburst and he is troubled and he too is going to poke with his despair at the margins. Lots of margins show up in chapter three. You can read it yourselves. There are then three lengthy, lengthy cycles of dialogue between Job and his discussion partners. And I'm well aware that this is where most of us sort of nod off in Job. We can kind of make it into chapter four, and then we may not come to again until chapter 38 or so. You have to force yourself to keep going through this, because it's interesting stuff. And we're going to look at some of it today, all right? We do have kind of an interlude in chapter 28, because the narrator, I think it's the narrator himself, is exploring wisdom. And that's going to go off in all sorts of margin directions as well. Job, the fourth friend. I use friend in quotation marks. But the fourth person there on site uh, have some additional monologues. And we're going to particularly refer to parts of Job's monologues and then the last part of Elihu's monologue. And then, well, <laughs> in God's responses, he is touring Job through all kinds of marginal regions and well beyond, well beyond. Narrative epilogue, chapter 42. That brings everything back to life with our feet on the ground, doesn't it? We've got a lot to do in the meantime. Uh, you're going to hear me say multiple times through our time together today, I'd like to spend a lot of more time there, but can't do it. Read Job. Here's where we're going to try and go in the next, well, whatever time we have. Uh, I want to look, first of all, at geographical spaces and indicators. These are very basic things, named locations, et cetera. We're going to spend some time there with a focus now on Transjordan. And by the way, it's not necessarily going to be as easy as we might think. Then I want to spend some time looking at what we see in Job about climate and weather. That's important going to have some judgment things that show up, as I mentioned earlier on, in kind of an introductory fashion to thunder and lightning and so forth. Then we're going to move into geoecological perspectives. In other words, coming back to what's going on with the land and who lives on it and how well are they able to live on it in that kind of a marginal context. And then finally, wildness is in the title, and we want to see a profound emphasis in this book on wildness, especially towards the end of the book. Wildness is celebrated. And so that's the direction we're going. Let's see how we do. Uh, just a quick note, I wanted to remind myself, so I'm reminding you at the same time. Uh, whenever we think of margins, uh, they're very much out of our comfort zones. 
pause and think about that for a moment and realize that most of the book of Job is going that direction. It's very interesting. Well, first of all, within our broad first category, geographical spaces and indicators, we're going to look at some named locations. We're going to take a quick look at Edom, since a lot of Job seems to be connected with a place called Edom, which you probably know from Old Testament. We're going to take a very brief look at how expansive the trade connections for people who lived in that area were, even though we call it marginal. All right? And then finally, uh, the first chapter of Job is fascinating. If we were to stop with that, this business about directional indicators, I think, will be very interesting to you. I hope it is. It is to me anyway. That's our first thing. Locations. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the land of, well, in Hebrew we pronounce it Uts. So forgive me. That's how I'm going to say it. It may sound, Uz sounds funny too. So Uz, Uts, whatever way you want to go with it. But at any rate, we find out that Uts is at least associated with Edom. So here's a map. And that ellipse gives us a general indication where Edom might be. We're going to come back to that frequently, but let me say this right from the get-go. That ellipse should not be viewed as solid boundaries. Not at all. It's just to give you an idea of where generally it was. I wished I could have had a dotted line that sort of zigzagged back and forth and moved as you were looking at it, because that would be a little bit more accurate. In Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 21, Rejoice and be glad, daughter of Edom, and this is, of course, a parallel statement, the one who dwells in the land of Uz. So we're seeing an association there. By the way, the very next verse says, guess what? The cup of wrath is coming to you to drink. So it, the rejoice is followed by something pretty sobering, which leads us to the next item. In Jeremiah 25, you can go back and read this, there is a long list. It's a really sobering list. Because it's, oh, that does, it's going to be a bad pun, as you're going to see in a moment. Uh, it's a long list of entities and people groups that are going to be given the cup of God's wrath to drink. Now, that fits pretty well with our Lamentations 4 one, doesn't it? But also, just think geographically here. The first person and entourage, if you will, is feral described rather at length. And then it says, I quote, all the kings of the land of Uts. Fairly extensive place, maybe. And then it goes on to the kings of the Philistines. Well, if you look at this map, you know that Egypt is off, sorry, Egypt is off the map to the southwest. Philistines are on that plain area. If you've got your telescope on, you can see Gaza and Ashdod. You can't see them, but anyway, they're there. That's the Philistine plain. All the kings of the land of Uts are in between there somehow. So let's uh, pretend that both our yellow ellipse and our red circle, sort of, are mobile and moving around, and there's some overlap there. Seems to be a location near Edom. That's the whole point. However, Edom was extending, however far it was extending. Now, if we were to read carefully, Genesis 36 mentions a lot of names. It's a lot of names, friends, but among them are Eliphaz, which shows up in the book of Job, and Uts, our good friend Uts. So again, maybe since Genesis 36 is all about the descendants of Esau, there's a connection there as well. You still with me? Bless your hearts. <laughs> Echoing Dr. Green from way back when. Regional names are important here as well. So our map is going to expand a little bit. As we read this first chapter, there are raiders from a place called Saba. We'll come back to that in a moment, but you can see where it is on the map. We also see folks that are called Chaldeans, which are probably coming from the area just north of the end of the Red Sea. And then finally we have, oh, now this is a puzzle, isn't it? Because Aram, Syria, you can see where it is, but then I've noted for you in a very abbreviated fashion, this might also be a possible location for this narrative as it unfolds. Why? Because as you read these passages that I've noted for you, they mention, in conjunction with Aram, Uts. Now that's another whole issue that we don't have time to get into. But just recognize there's a lot of flexibility here, isn't there, in terms of location. Because marginal locations, well, let's put it this way. Transjordan home to nomadic tribes, they moved around a lot. 
They didn't have walled cities, and so the peoples that are parts of this narrative may have been rather mobile and geo-ethnic. Boundaries are fluid at the best. Our most definitive border in this whole story as we're unfolding it is probably the Jordan River. On the west side is, well, it's the land where God planted his people, with the exception of two and a half tribes. The east side was Transjordan. That means across the Jordan, and that has all kinds of layers and implications. Well, we're getting on there. A quick note about Edom. Are you realizing we're just beginning? Isn't this fun? Uh, zeroing in on Edom itself, there are some definitive sections of Edom. And for our purposes, I want to point out that kind of square, or sorry, rectangle there. Because it's north, and with the elevation being as it is, they have. Snow, clouds, lightning, thunder, tempests. You know, sometimes when you and I think of the Middle East, we think it's always going to be 120 degrees. And we're going to be cooking there. That's not true, by the way. Jerusalem just had snow last week, so that's kind of fun. But at any rate, uh, we've got snow and all those things accompanying it in northern Edom. So when you have mentions of those in the book of Job, especially in chapters 37 through 39, uh, that fits. Not making it up. Author didn't live in New England. There you go. Parts of Edom are also called Mount Seir. This general area, again, whenever you see outlines on my maps, they're very flexible and fluid. To the east of that, same map looking a different direction because vast, vast, vast plateaus spread off into Arabia. But you have people who were geographers. George Adam Smith was writing in the late 1800s, and he said there were whole swarms of nomads that would come. And you can turn that arrow around, basically. If I were really technically good, I'd turn it around for you, because they then come and make raids on people who lived in the area of Edom and so forth. Another interesting explorer, Johann Burckhardt. Oh, this is the man who rediscovered Petra, that famous red city that everybody, uh, well, longs to get to, and he did too. Uh, at any rate, he, in his travels in Syria and the Holy Land, and note the date of that, right, 1822, he talks about Bedouin tribes who would make 20-day-long raiding trips. And he actually mentions at one point running off with 1,200 camels. They raided, got 1,200 camels, and went running away. This is going to be important for Job. I bet you know why. Uh, those of you who know anything about Lawrence of Arabia, a very famous figure back in the early 20th century, uh, Lowell Thomas, really famous reporter, actually traveled with Lawrence and talks about the camel raids, too. So this is a, an incredible region that's wild, and it's on the margins, margins in many ways. Well, just a couple things on trade connections. Uh, rather than just being off in the middle of nowhere, this was a very significant north-south trade route, and they got spices going on that trade route. And spices were exceedingly valuable. Spices were used in religious and uh, uh, funeral kinds of uh, and, and anointments for kings and royal circumstances. So this is a lucrative business. A place called Taman is right along one of those routes. And so our first friend, Eliphaz the Tamanite, he comes from a pretty significant location. Later on, when Job starts talking, chapter 6 mentions caravans, i.e., we're talking about trade connections here, caravans from a place called Tama and convoys from Sheba, both probably carrying spices. That was spice territory. But you know what? They wander off into the wrong places, and they perish for lack of water. Ooh, that's grim. And then there's gold coming from Ophir and topaz from Cush. One last thing in our first section, right? These are our significant directional indicators, and there are really two categories here. The first one is simply, it says, hey, Job was greater than all the persons of the East. That's an accolade. So who are all the persons of the East? Well, probably we're talking about all those nomadic tribes. And don't think that for a moment that they didn't know much. They were known for wisdom. 
In fact, Solomon in chapter four of 1 Kings is gonna be mentioning that sort of thing as well. So it's an extensive area. But more for our purposes and more for my interest is this. In chapter one, and I'm gonna unpack these four disasters momentarily, but it's fascinating to me that they come from the four points of the compass. The whole point is they are comprehensive, right? North, east, south, west, that's comprehensive. And let's notice something else. I hope you go back and read Job 1 sometime tonight. As you read these, it's fascinating. They alternate between coming from human raiders on earth or something going on in the heavenly realms. And we'll see those in a moment. So it's comprehensive in every way. Four points of the compass from heavens to earth, kind of a marismus if you want to put it that way. Therefore, chapter one is ind indicating to us, even geographically and literarily for that matter, how horrible these things were that happened to Job. And as I noticed for you, um, in the Hebrew, the incessant word is they fell, they fell, they fell, they fell. That's the verb that keeps being used in that context. Interestingly enough, what happens when Job reacts? He falls to his face, he falls to his face. Well, first of all, we have the Sabaeans. We've mentioned that already. They're coming from South Arabia, so that's our southern compass point. Then we have, well, it's an interesting expression, fire from God. All right, that's one way of saying the superlative. An over-the-top fire, maybe an over-the-top burst of lightning. The suggestion is that this may well refer to an off-the-charts thunderstorm brewing over the Mediterranean Sea and, as thunderstorms are wont to do in that area, sweeping in, all right? So we got something coming from the west, southwest. Chaldeans, we've located them already. They would have followed the Fertile Crescent as they were doing raiding, right? So here they go, and they're coming to attack in that way. These are the ones that ripped off 3,000 camels. And then finally, the text says, a mighty wind roared in from the desert, which was to the east. So south, west, north, east. It is comprehensive. And that tells us something. It's subtle to be sure, but it tells us something. I'm gonna come back to that east wind business a little bit later on, so just hang with me there. That's our first category, over and done with, pack it up, now we're moving to climate and weather metaphors, right? So climate and weather, uh, hints. I'm not doing any way a, a comprehensive statement out of things in the book, just hints that we have. And first I'm going to try and outline what I've called a macro perspective because as Job is talking, chapter 12, this is a remarkable chapter, it talks, he talks in chapter 12 all about God's sovereignty. And one of the areas that he's talking about is God's sovereignty over weather and for a purpose. God both holds back the waters and we've seen how disastrous that would be now because you've looked at those dry areas. But he also brings the devastation of floods. That's a macro lens. And then another macro lens, if you will. We have that fourth individual whose name is Elihu, who basically is a forerunner. His last two and a half, sorry, one and a half chapters are setting the stage for the arrival of God in the whirlwind. And Elihu is describing a storm, right? Its approach is described by Elihu, it increases in power, it sweeps across the vast reaches of the land and it brings judgment. It brings God's judgment. God himself, that's chapter 37. God himself will refer in chapter 38 to the fact that he has storehouses, storehouses of snow and hail, specifically reserved for battle. And you're going, okay, well, that's a really nice figure of speech. I rather like that. Well, go back and read Joshua 10. I put it here on purpose because in Joshua 10, we have a most fascinating historical incident. And I'm just gonna put one verse out there for now. As the Israelites are fighting their enemies, it says there was a huge storm and the Lord dumped hail on them and more of the enemies were killed as a result of the hail than the Israelites' efforts to be fighting. So that gives you a little bit of a sense in terms of some of the supernatural aspects that are going on here. Well, 
A few more things we want to point out in terms of weather and climate. Uh, we see some really striking metaphors here. Chapter 6 again. Job says, unfaithful friends, I really like this one. Well, I don't like unfaithful friends, but unfaithful friends are just like streams that vanish in a hot and dry season. And in that context, that would carry a lot of punch. Streams just go away. They vanish. They end in the hot, dry season. Unfaithful friends, likewise. You see uh, what might have in a time of water had some water in it, but not now. Another one. As drought steals away snow melt. It snows. It melts. Be nice if it stayed. Doesn't. Sheol. Another word for the underworld the grave with all of its uneasy things going on there. Sheol snatches those who have sinned. These are Job's metaphors. By way of contrast, the refreshing nature of showers and spring rain. By the way, you know, the climate is such that, by and large, it rains between October-ish and April-ish. And then it doesn't rain all summer long. And those spring rains are so significant because they're giving a little boost to a long, dry season, all right? So Job is saying, his conversation when he used to be in a position where people respected and honored him as they should have, uh, his conversation was awaited with the same kind of joy and hope that people waited for the spring rains. And a few more things about blessing in general. It's really interesting to me that as the Lord God is speaking, in his final tumultuous responses. He has spent a good amount of time talking about the wild animals giving birth. And then he talks about he himself fathering the rain and the drops of dew and birthing ice and frost. Even when there isn't any human being that needs them, the Lord God brings those things. And Chapter 37, this is Elihu speaking, says, when God says to the snow, fall on the earth, it does. Now, you're going to think I took this picture two weeks ago out my front window. But what's the dead giveaway? There's camels there. This is Petra in 2020, interestingly enough, and that's a fairly significant snowfall far down in the southern part of Edom. Well, those are basically... Um, lovely uses of snow and water and ice and rain. But there are some other water images that teach some other kinds of lessons. And Job notes them. He's talking about how fleeting life is. If you've studied Ecclesiastes, there's going to be some echoes back and forth here between Ecclesiastes and this. Life vanishes just as clouds do. Hevel kinds of stuff, right? Flowers spring up only to shrivel. Papyrus, a reed without water, this is Bildad speaking, wither quickly as does the hope of the ungodly. Notice how all of these lessons that are interfacing with morals and ethics and all that sort of stuff, drawing their heft, if you will, from what we have in our geographical imagery. Even though a felled tree can produce new shoots, and perhaps you've seen that happening, it does. Cut off an olive tree, shoots will come up around the base. But not so with human hope. When life is gone, hope is gone, life is gone. And even, not just plants, but mountains. Huge, immobile, everlasting foundations, but mountains erode because water is grinding away at them. And Job says, so it is with hope. Well, I mentioned a moment ago we were going to talk about the east wind. And again, if we don't have a sense of east wind, we read past it way too fast. But take my word for it, it is witheringly hot and very, very dry, scorchingly dry. It's called Hamsin. Sirocco, yes, but Hamsin, basically. And we have references in Job to that as well. The first of his companions with whom he discusses, Eliphaz, says, Job's words are like the east wind. That's kind of interesting. If you want to insult somebody, just say, they're talking like the east wind. Their words are scorching and hot and dry. It probably won't make much of an impression. But at any rate, 
More soberly, Job declares that this terrible east wind is going to be the means by which evil people are finally swept away and all that will be left will be hissing. And then just a broader look, when you uh, see both you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, and some of the others, uh, east wind is our standard trope, if you will, for judgment that God is planning. Perhaps you know the Jonah reference. That's where Jonah has gone to the east of Nineveh and is just waiting with his hands rubbing together for Nineveh to be judged. But God brings an east wind, and it gets to be pretty unpleasant for Jonah in that context. Well, one more thing about east wind. The Lord God himself says, hey, you know, I have got a place in my heavenly realms for that east wind. So just like the hail we mentioned a moment ago that the Lord uses for judgment, he uses the east wind as well. Fascinating stuff. Well, where does it come from? In case you're interested, this is a big area. And the African deserts, the Arabian deserts are vast and hot. And every once in a while, the winds will switch around. Prevailing wind is from the west, bringing moist, wonderful air from across the Mediterranean Sea. But every once in a while, it'll switch. And you get dust, and you get grit, and you get dirt that you can breathe and chew, because it looks a little bit like this when it starts. And it looks kind of like this after it's been going for a while. That's shooting straight into the sun, by the way, in Transjordan. <laughs> and so you get a sense that this is an air full of dust and dust particles. But you know what? They blow away pretty quickly. They're a picture of transients which again reminds us not only of Job, he's going to refer to this, but also Genesis 3, that we will all return to dust. So there's a lesson in that as well. Job and his dialogue partners acknowledge the cycle. They say, we're formed from clay, and we're going to be returned to dust. Genesis 3, to dust you shall return. Well, we got two things done, locations, climate, now, geoecological perspectives, and I'm going to go through this, believe it or not, even more quickly because I'm aiming for wildness. That's my favorite part of this talk. But we need to look at productivity of the land, that is, after all, geoecological, because those things contribute to power and to status. Job's going to have had those. He's going to lose them, and it's very evident. We're going to look at pastoral metaphors for virtue. Because that's part of the whole discussion as these four are going round and round and round. They're going to accuse Job of not having virtue at some points. And then there's a couple of domestic allusions that I want to point out. So first of all, what the land produces and how it affects who Job is or who people are in that thing. Here you go. You can read as well as I can. So let's zip right through this. The first two bullets are the most important. When you have possessions spread over the land, and remember the kind of land we're talking about here. It's not farmland in Nebraska. But when you have possessions spread over the land, those are usually flocks and herds. So skip down to our first sub-bullet. That's representing the pastoral part of this. And then ownership of land and vineyards is going to represent those communities that cultivate. And if all those are flourishing, those are indicators of wealth. And we know Job was there. However, final bullet on this page. Now we're going to pause and put together what we've done so far with what happened to Job in chapter 1. Because his economic catastrophe was comprehensive. I've tried to hint at that comprehensiveness already. But he lost oxen and donkeys. That means his agricultural life had been absolutely decimated. Because they do all the work, right, in the agricultural context, especially the oxen. He's lost flocks, thousands of sheep. That means his pastoral richness is gone. He's lost 3,000 camels. That means that any trading he was doing, and he probably was doing a lot, done, done, no income from that. And as I note, that doesn't even begin to address what's going on in the loss of 10 children or his health as well. 
My friends who teach this area say you always have to have a picture of a camel in a talk that has to do with geography. So I'm giving you two. Let's go. <laughs> Job's additional losses. In addition to losing those things we've just talked about, economic stuff. This is a culture that is very strong on honor and shame, right? And Job was an honored man, but that's extremely fragile. And he gets thrust outside immediately when he no longer has all those trappings of wealth and health, etc. And he gets pushed to the dregs of society. This is the margins of the margins, if you will. He's an outsider. And these chapters are poignant. They should make us weep because his friends, his family, his servants, people around him, spit at him, try and trip him up. It's ugly stuff. And as we note from chapter two already, he's scraping himself with potsherds because his sores are so ugly. This is not good. Here's his self-description. He says he's lower than those who roam barren regions spending nights in wastelands. Maybe something like this. Those who live in dry stream beds, no tent, no house, no home. They live in rocks, they live in caves, they live under shrubs. And perpetually hungry, always hungry. What do they dine on? Salt wort. I'll show you a picture in a moment. They dig up broom tree roots and nibble on those. Imagine. He's been reduced to that. So in case you're wondering about salt herbs, uh, this is what they look like. And by the way, these taste salty. The leaves taste salty. They're great in salad. But if that's all you're eating, it's not much. It's not much. And uh, here is a broom tree. Perry and I took this. I'm oh, sorry. This is a picture of Perry. It was supposed to illustrate Elijah under a broom tree. But I thought I'd use it for this one, too. <laughs> anyway, uh, But imagine digging up the roots of that and eating it. It's not a lot. Subsistence level. And the flip side of what we saw earlier in terms of wealth is here in terms of absence of wealth. They presumed, his friends presumed, that if he didn't have things that had to do with plowing, sowing, flowing, that he was unvirtuous. I'll just read these. Those who plow and sow trouble are going to reap it. Fools may take root. Their pasture land is cursed. And then you can read on about thorns and vines stripped and absence of grain, new wine, and oil. These are presumably the indicators that there's no virtue going on. If, on the other hand, according to the presentation of the friends, one is in God's favor, then they're going to, this is Elihu, by the way, chapter 5 is not, sorry, it's Eliphaz, going to be protected from famine, wild animals, theft of property, tents are safe and peace with the wild creatures, and then it says something that shows up only in the Hebrew Bible, and that is going to have a covenant with stones. Well, that's interesting. If you look at that picture, uh, those are grapevines, and you'll see in between there on the right and the middle, it looks like it's growing in stones. This is a stony, rocky land. It's a tough place to live. Well, Job says it doesn't work that way at all. People who are evil not only create difficulties for themselves. I'm sorry. People who are evil enjoy the things that uh, are supposed to actually characterize what it is to be living a virtuous life. I'm going to move quickly because I want to get to our wildness. So forgive me. I've been a little bit flummoxed there because I want to get through some of this. Uh, but here, by the way, is your high-end uh, living in that context. This is a tent. And one of the things we notice is that tents were really houses in this context. Our Burkhart man that we referred to earlier on says just about each community had 120 tents. And they were mobile. This is a moving population, oftentimes. They're the equivalent of houses, but it's indicative of the fact that they live as transients in this world. The permanent houses, and I use that again carefully, the permanent houses really are where they're going to be buried. And Job will refer to the fact that kings are storing up silver for themselves in their permanent houses, in their graves. 
multi-chambered family complexes characterized by shadows, night, darkness. It's intense. That darkness is intense. You can feel it as you're reading it. I'll show you in a moment something that might help us get a feeling for that. There's maggots and worms around. And we mustn't forget that on top of everything else, Job is facing the greatest margin, the greatest possible margin, the move from life to death, right? Now, this is not going to help unless you use your imagination. So use your imagination. Those bodies that are lying there would have been in a dark chamber. This would have been dug into rock. So now when it's been discovered, it's out in the open. But it would have been in a dark chamber. Uh, if you look at the mourners who are standing in black, they too would have been in this dark chamber. The big flat area would have been round about a place where they would come and deposit the next deceased individual that they had to and do all the mourning rituals that were necessary. Job talks about these things. We've mentioned some of them already, but he goes on and says, if only I had been carried from the womb to the grave, which is a land of gloom, deep shadow, deep night, deep disorder, where the light is like darkness. Imagine yourself walking into that completely dark room where there are already deceased family members. Underneath where some of those folks are lying there is places where they might have gathered the bones and put the bones down there. So this is an ongoing place of burial, decay, disruption, and so forth. But I want to go to the wildness. This is where we're going to end. So now you can all perk up just a tad bit. The book of Job is not at all shy about referring to that which is wild. Some wild creatures are, well, they're scary. And they talk about lions, venomous cobras and vipers. There's one little picture there. This is a little guy but he's one of the worst in the Sinai Peninsula. We view them with trepidation because they're scary. But you know what? The Lord loves them all, and he's talking about them at length. They're the major part of his tour of the whole of the created order that he gives to Job. I'll say more about that in a moment. Now, can you find the mountain goat? Oh, good. He's right there. Wild, wild. Wild. It's all wild. And every step of this chapter, 39, is about wildness that the Lord just loves. I'm coming back to that. They're hawks, vultures. They nest in rocky crags. This should remind us of the book of Obadiah. But here's the interesting thing. As the Lord God describes this, notice that he says they are scavenging on corpses. He recognizes that. And they're human corpses. They're the gruesome end of the food chain. We've got a scent of death here, margin from life to death, from life to death. And God will talk about that, too. He features the wild creatures. And here's what I want to get to. What's the point of all this? What's the point of going on and on about these wild creatures? We've talked about other margins, and we've got lessons we've derived from some of those margins. But what about this wildness stuff? Well, here's a start. Wildness, which remember, we sometimes veer with, view with trepidation, with fear. It's a matter of delight to the Lord. And elements, as we're going to see in a moment, that are even verging on what is chaotic, possibly dangerous, they reflect as well his creative wisdom. And he revels in it, he celebrates it, and he subdues it only to a point. And I'm going to come back to that in about two minutes when we get to our wonderful Leviathan. Now, you've heard, I'm sure, of Behemoth and Leviathan. And we could spend, as I'm sure you well know, uh, more than one lecture on that. So in two minutes, we're not going to do it justice. Our figures as they show up in this last segment of Job are kind of a merging together of both physical, possible characteristics of creatures, but also something that's mythical, legendary. In some ways, behemoth looks a little bit like a hippopotamus, although there are some features of it that might not be, as you may know. Leviathan sounds kind of like a super crocodile, but probably not. 
Both of these creatures together appear in Egyptian uh, designations, pictures of a pharaoh, who by the way, pharaohs considered themselves kind of divine too. And so here they are wrestling uh, these cosmic forces because that's what these two creatures represent. I.e., they lodge between observable and supernatural. They're on the edge. They're on the margin, big time. Behema is a singular word. It simply means domestic animal. Behemoth is plural. Not used very often. So this is the ultimate in a land beast. Leviathan, oh my goodness. As I said, we could spend an hour here. But this is wild. This is where I want to go. This is a wild creature. Job already knew him. Job in chapter 3, where he's expressing his deep despair, is asking for those who summon Leviathan. That's scary to do. Later on, he recognizes that God himself has carved up somebody called Rahav. That's also one of those mythic creatures. And he's pierced a gliding serpent who happens to be Leviathan. Now, the Lord's Leviathan in this chapter at the end well, you can read it. He's brilliant, fast, ferocious, fearless, tearing through the roiling seas. He's king over all the majestic beasts that has all kinds of things going on. According to Isaiah chapter 27, he's God's enemy. But according to Psalm 104, the Lord has created him to frolic in the sea. Isn't that an incredible combination? It's all just so complex in its own wonderful way. At any rate, now we're going to wind it together and see if we can draw some conclusions. The Lord's approach to Job was wild. And so is the universe that he's describing. Way beyond the boundaries of things now. And we've learned some lessons, by the way, from our earlier chapters. But the ecologies of terra firma, if you will, just point us as God is pointing us to things far beyond. He surges onto the scene with a barrage of questions. But here's the point. Those questions are not to squelch Job, I don't think. There's disagreement on this. But to invite him to adopt a radically altered perspective, emphasizing possibilities. So when the Lord says, where were you? Who does this? On what and do you know? And can you command lead forth sin? Job couldn't answer the questions. But he's giving a verbal glimpse. He's been given a verbal glimpse of God's wildness and the fact that God revels in that wildness, whether it's this side of the margins or the other side. The Lord takes him to inaccessible places. And I'm going to skip these and get to our last two. I'm going to give you a moment to speed read this if you want to. But our main point is the Lord will describe his cosmic temple. That's the whole of creation, by the way. As king, in these chapters, the first chapter 38, God describes his laying the cornerstone of all of creation. And all of creation is his cosmic temple. The sons of God are there singing. The stars in the morning are singing too. And I note for you, by the way, it's an interesting lot because in chapter 1, the sons of God includes the adversary coming into the Lord's presence. So God has this all under control. Doesn't squelch it. God, sorry, Job had asked those stars of the dawn to be quiet and to be silenced. But in God's temple, they shout in exultation. The sea. So God makes his cosmic temple, creates it, lays the cornerstone, has a liturgy celebration. But then the very next picture is the Lord God who wraps the sea up as if it's a little baby. God the midwife. And of course, the sea in the wider cultural context was viewed as scary, the abyss, chaos, stay away from it. God has it totally under control. Well, just some fledgling observations because I am seeing I'm one minute over here. Our master teacher, Job's master teacher, uses a very interesting process. But it's an important one. And perhaps we can learn from it as we go through. If Job couldn't respond even to those very foundational questions, many of which were lodged in contexts that he knew that he could see, could his fingers on, 
how in the world could he possibly begin to question God's justice? How possibly? Because he'd have to enter into this chaos, this untamed wild, this beyond description, beauty but frightening. And going on, does Job have the wherewithal to sort through right and wrong in that tangle of threads? No. But nevertheless, God has given him an invitation to know that the God himself is the brilliant, radiant presence in control of things this side of the margins, on the margins, but also in those wilds, wilds way beyond. The Nicene Creed talks about things visible and invisible. And this is our Lord God who is at the center of all those realities, whether they are, as I said, this side of the margin or not. I am going to simply, this is a lovely little icon, which has Job in the grave and Jesus on his throne. At any rate, a couple of lessons perhaps in face of God's boundless creative wisdom and mystery that we've just been unpacking way too fast. Our job right now is actually to walk carefully with God. It seems like a simple boiled down lesson, but it is so important once we have in our heads who this God is in all his radiant presence. And you can't help but do uh, that by virtue of studying scriptures assiduously. Does that sound like an Old Testament professor? Some of us never retire. <laughs> but with that, I will retire. So thank you all. You've been most attentive at this difficult, long, fast lecture. Thank you.